My father secretly got married. When the golden sister appeared, I was ignored because stepmother wanted to create the perfect family without me. And then I? I always thought I knew my parents, who they were, how they met, the kind of life they lived before I came along. They were just normal people in my eyes, steady and predictable. Mom had her routines, dad had his habits, and while their relationship wasn't perfect, it seemed typical enough. They didn't talk much about their past, but I never thought to ask. To me, their lives began when mine did. But all of that changed the day I found an old, worn-out shoebox buried deep in the basement. I wasn't looking for anything special. I was just cleaning up, trying to make some space, and came across it in the corner, hidden behind a stack of dusty books. The box was sealed tight with a faded, fraying ribbon, and when I untied it, the lid creaked open like it hadn't been touched in years. Inside, there were letters, dozens of them, yellowed with age, the edges curling. They were handwritten, in a looping, delicate script I didn't recognize. It wasn't my mom's handwriting. I pulled one out, and as I unfolded the brittle paper, my heart raced without me even knowing why. The date on the letter was from decades ago, long before I was born and it was addressed to my mother from someone I'd never heard of. As I read the first few lines, a strange, sinking feeling took hold of me. The words on the page weren't just casual notes or friendly updates. They were love letters, passionate and intense, from a man who wasn't my father. He wrote about secret meetings, about nights they'd spent together, and promises they'd made to each other. The man in the letters clearly loved my mother in a way I'd never seen my dad show her. At first, I thought there had to be some mistake. Maybe this was from before she met my dad. But as I kept reading, I realized the letters were from the same time they were supposedly already together. They spoke of moments that lined up with my parents' early years. The times when I thought they were solid. When they were building the life that eventually led to me. There was no mention of my father. No hint that she was living a double life. But it was clear from the way the man wrote that their relationship had gone on for a long time and that he had expected her to leave my father for him. It was all there, hidden in plain sight. The affair, the lies, the betrayal that had been buried for so many years. And then, beneath the letters, I found photographs. There were only a few, but they were enough. In one, my mother was sitting on the edge of a bed, laughing in a way I had never seen her laugh before. She looked younger, freer, like a different version of the woman I thought I knew. Beside her, smiling, was the man from the letters. I stared at the photo, trying to connect the dots, trying to understand how my parents' life, the life I was a part of, had this hidden chapter that had nothing to do with me. I put everything back in the box and shoved it deep into the corner where I'd found it, but it was too late. The damage was done. That image of my mother, that raw honesty in the letters, had lodged itself in my mind. I couldn't unsee it. I couldn't go back to thinking of my parents as simple, predictable people who had always been who they were now. There was a whole other side to them I'd never known, and suddenly, everything I thought I understood about them, about love, loyalty, and trust, started to unravel. I never said anything about what I found. Not to my mom, not to my dad. But from that day on, every time I looked at them, a part of me wondered who they really were before they became my parents and what else they had kept hidden. My weekends with my dad were my absolute favorite part of the week. Despite the fact that my parents split up when I was just five, I never felt like I was missing out on anything. My dad, Elijah, made sure I had the best time whenever we were together. It wasn't fancy stuff, but it was perfect. Every weekend, it was just the two of us. We'd go to the movies, play soccer in the park, or head out on his fishing boat. I even remember us biking to the lake near the old neighborhood, eating sandwiches by the shore like nothing in the world mattered except us. It was just simple. Happy. I didn't need anything more because everything felt right. Dad was like my best friend. I could talk to him about anything, and I always knew we'd end our day with a big hug, him ruffling my hair and telling me I was the best kid in the world. Even after my mom remarried, I never felt any strain. I had my weekends with Dad, and during the week, it was Mom, me, and my stepdad Bill, who was mostly cool. I'd tell anyone I had the best of both worlds. But everything changed when I turned 12. Elijah met someone new, some woman named Rebecca, and within two weeks, 
literally just two weeks. She and her two kids, Grace and Mia, were moving in. Suddenly, everything that was ours, everything that made Dad's place feel like home, was turned upside down. My bedroom? Gone. Dad told me, casually, that they needed the space, and that I'd be fine sharing with Mia. It wasn't even sharing, though. Mia, who was just eight, got to keep all the drawers for her toys, and I was given one measly drawer for my clothes. And, oh yeah, my bed? It was now a mattress in the corner. Later, they moved my mattress into a literal closet. No joke. I'm not even exaggerating. Rebecca said it was the best option since I didn't spend that much time at Dad's house. I went from having my own room, my own space, to being shoved in a closet like I didn't matter at all. And you know what hurt the most? Elijah didn't say a thing about it. He didn't stand up for me, didn't ask me how I felt about it. He just acted like it was normal. He changed so much. Over time, it only got worse. I became more and more invisible in that house. Rebecca's older daughter, Grace, got her own room while Mia and I shared the tiniest one. Every time I visited, I felt like an outsider, a guest in the home that was once partly mine. The weekend trips to the movies or the lake, they stopped. Dad was always too busy, or we'll see, but we never did anything. I wasn't his priority anymore. One weekend, I found out something that crushed me. My dad and Rebecca had gotten married, and no one had even told me. Not a word. I wasn't invited to the wedding. In fact, I found out weeks later when I saw a wedding photo on the wall. And then, just when I thought it couldn't get worse, I overheard Rebecca talking about their newborn daughter, Lily. I didn't even know my dad had another kid. No one told me. How messed up is that? Elijah stopped paying child support to my mom, too, as soon as he married Rebecca. Apparently, his new family was more important. It was like I didn't even exist to him anymore. He was all about his new wife, her kids, their baby, anything but me. I felt like I was a burden, an afterthought. He only cared about them. And then, as if this twisted situation couldn't get any more absurd, Elijah started treating me like some kind of buddy instead of his daughter. He'd rant about politics and conspiracies whenever I was around, telling me about all these bizarre theories, as if I even cared. When I'd try to talk about something that mattered to me, he'd cut me off, dismissing it like it wasn't important. I couldn't even have a real conversation with him anymore. The real kicker? I found out why my parents got divorced in the first place. Elijah cheated on my mom during some trip to Canada. That was it. The reason everything fell apart. Knowing that made me feel sick. Like all the good memories I had with him were somehow tainted. I didn't just feel betrayed. I felt like I didn't even know who he was anymore. The weird thing is, over time, my relationship with Bill, my stepdad, actually got better. I used to resent him when I was younger, mostly because of stuff my dad said about him. But now, Bill's the one who supports me. He's the one who encourages me to follow my dreams, who brags about me to other people. He even calls me his daughter sometimes, and it doesn't feel forced. It feels real, like we're actually a family. I visit Elijah's house less and less these days. I mean, why would I go there? I'm a guest in my own father's life. He doesn't even ask me when I'm coming anymore. I show up, sleep in a guest bed, because that's what it feels like now, and leave without feeling like I belong there at all. But the guilt is always there, lurking. Elijah makes it seem like it's all my fault, like I'm the one who doesn't care because I don't call him enough. But how can I when he's the one who pushed me out? Still, there's always this voice in my head that wonders if I should be trying harder, if I should just suck it up and be happy for him and his new family. But I can't. It hurts too much. After the divorce, Christmas with Elijah used to be something I looked forward to, even when things started going south. But this past Christmas felt like a breaking point for me. While Rebecca and her daughters, Grace and Mia, were tearing into heaps of presents, there I was, sitting on the edge of the couch, waiting for something, anything, that would show I was still part of his life. I knew not to expect much, but I wasn't prepared for what came next. Elijah handed me an envelope with a flat smile and a half-hearted, Merry Christmas. Inside was $100. It wasn't the amount that stung, though that hurt too, considering the mountains of toys and gadgets piled around me that weren't for me. What really drove the knife in was when he said, buy something for yourself and let the rest go toward the child support I owe. 
His tone was casual, like we were talking about splitting the bill at a diner. That hundred dollars? It was a joke. A fake Christmas present. What he owed in child support was far, far more. But I guess in his mind, that hundred bucks was enough to make up for everything. I don't even know what I did with that money. Probably tossed it in a drawer somewhere. Forgotten like the relationship it represented. That holiday left a pit in my stomach, and for the first time, I found myself genuinely wishing he would lose custody of me altogether. I didn't want this anymore. I wanted Bill, my stepdad, to adopt me, to make everything official. I didn't want to be legally tied to Elijah, the man who barely acknowledged my existence unless it was to blame me for something or push me aside for his new family. I told my mom how I felt. She listened, but I could tell she thought I was being too rash, too harsh. Your dad still deserves your love and respect she said, like it was that simple, like respect wasn't something that had to be earned. But what had Elijah done to earn it? He barely even talked to me when I visited. Our conversations were either about his new life or his ridiculous conspiracy theories. He'd ramble on about how the government was lying to everyone, about how we were all sheep being led by some hidden agenda. I tuned him out more and more. It was easier that way. The less I listened, the less it hurt. On one of my last visits to his place, I sat at the kitchen table while he talked non-stop about the latest thing Grace and Mia were up to, what Rebecca had bought, and how they were redecorating the house. Not once did he ask how I was doing. He didn't care about my school, my life, my anything. And then, when he finally did say something about me, it was to complain. He said my grades weren't good enough, and then somehow the conversation spiraled back into one of his conspiracy rants. I felt like I was sitting there, completely invisible. My words trapped inside me because there was no point in saying anything. It wasn't just him either. Grace, my so-called older sister, avoided me like the plague. She locked herself in her room every time I visited, only coming out when she knew I was gone. At first, I thought it was just her being a typical teenager, but over time it became clear. She wanted nothing to do with me. She had her own life, her own room and I was just this unwanted piece of her new reality. It was like I was an inconvenience to everyone in that house. Mia, the younger sister I had to share a room with, was no better. One weekend, she had a friend over, and when I came to visit, I found their stuff strewn all over my bed. Well, what was supposed to be my bed? Mia acted like it was her space and I was just borrowing it. Her things were everywhere, and when I tried to clear a corner for my own stuff, she acted like I was invading her territory. It was just another reminder that nothing in that house belonged to me anymore. Not even the tiny sliver of space I was given. Rebecca never made it any easier either. She always seemed surprised when I showed up, like no one told her I was coming. Elijah never bothered to inform her. So she'd just give me this look, like I was some sort of burden she had to put up with. It was clear she didn't like having me there, and that feeling of being unwelcome hung over every visit. I could see it in the way she sighed when she thought I wasn't looking, the way she rushed through pleasantries before disappearing with her kids to leave me with Elijah. And of course, he didn't even try to make things better. In fact, he turned me into a babysitter more often than not. One weekend, he just dumped Mia on me, told me to take her to the playground while he ran errands with Rebecca. I sat on that park bench, watching Mia run around, while I seated inside. I wasn't there to be her caretaker. I wasn't there to play big sister, to kids who didn't even acknowledge me. But Elijah didn't see it that way. To him, it was all one big happy family. Except, I didn't feel like part of that family. I felt like an outsider, someone who was only there because he was legally obligated to spend time with me. I told my mom I didn't want to go back. I was done with it. Done with feeling like a stranger in my own father's life. And she agreed, at least at first. But every time I thought I was done, she'd nudge me to give him another chance to be the bigger person and visit. I didn't know what she was thinking. Did she really believe things would magically get better? One night, after yet another awful weekend at Elijah's, I decided to send him a long text explaining how I felt. I poured out everything. The neglect, the feeling of being unwanted, the pain of being ignored while he lavished attention on his new family. I thought maybe, just maybe, he'd read it and understand. Maybe he'd finally see how much he was hurting me. But no, that's not what happened. Instead, he
He called me and screamed at me over the phone. He accused me of being spoiled, of being dramatic. He said I was the reason our relationship was falling apart because I didn't call him enough, because I didn't visit as much as I should. He put all the blame on me, like it was my fault that I didn't feel welcome in his house anymore. He said I was selfish for not being happy for him and his new family, for not embracing this new life he had created. After that call, he left me a voicemail saying he was having money problems, that things were tight. But I knew that was a lie. I'd seen him buy Grace and Mia all kinds of expensive things. New clothes, new phones, vacations. He wasn't struggling. He just didn't want to spend anything on me. He wanted me to believe that my hurt and anger were unfounded, that it was all in my head, but I knew better. The final blow came when I asked my mom to talk to Bill about adopting me. I figured if Elijah didn't want me, I didn't want him either. Bill had been more of a father to me than Elijah had been in years, and I wanted that to be official. But when I asked my mom, she told me that Bill didn't want to do it. He thought it would hurt Elijah too much. Another rejection. Another person choosing Elijah's feelings over mine. Now, I'm 15, and I feel like I'm carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders. My mom thinks I'm too young to feel this way, too young to understand the complexities of adult relationships. But I understand enough. I know what it feels like to be abandoned, to be treated like an outsider in your own family. I know what it feels like to be completely alone. After everything that had happened with Elijah, I started to feel like I was breaking apart inside. I knew I needed to talk to someone. Someone who wasn't caught up in the mess of our family. I didn't feel comfortable talking to my mom about everything. Not in the way I needed to. Bill was great, but he didn't get it either. So, I decided to ask my mom if I could go to therapy. I thought it would help to finally talk to a professional about everything that had been building up inside me. About Elijah. About the way I felt like I was just drifting between these two families, never really belonging to either. But when I brought it up, my mom shot the idea down immediately. She told me therapists were stupid, that all they did was make people feel worse. Why would you need a stranger to tell you how to feel? She asked, as if the answer was obvious. Instead, she suggested I pray or talk to her if I needed to. But how could I? I loved my mom, but I didn't trust her to understand everything. Every time I tried to open up about Elijah, it felt like she wanted to change the subject or minimize how much it hurt. And praying? Sure, it might bring some comfort, but it wasn't going to solve the deep-seated issues I was dealing with. I felt like I was drowning, and the one thing that could throw me a lifeline was being yanked away. So, I kept it all to myself. The pain, the frustration, the feeling of being utterly lost in my own life. Elijah hadn't contacted me since his last voicemail, and honestly, I didn't care to hear from him anymore. Every time I thought about him, it was like a dark cloud hanging over me, a reminder of the person he used to be and the person he had become. The man who used to take me fishing, who used to tell me I was the best kid in the world, wasn't the man I knew anymore. That version of him had disappeared, and I wasn't going to keep chasing someone who clearly wasn't willing to fix the damage he had caused. Thankfully, Bill and his family continued to show me what real love and support looked like. Even though Bill didn't want to adopt me, probably out of respect for Elijah, which still hurt more than I let on, I could feel that he cared about me like I was his own. His family treated me like I was part of them, and for the first time in a long time, I felt like I was part of a real family again. Bill wasn't perfect, but he was there for me in ways that Elijah never could be anymore. Every time he praised me or took an interest in my life, I felt seen. I felt valued. But for some reason, I still wasn't ready to completely cut Elijah out of my life. There was a part of me, maybe the part that remembered who he used to be, that wanted to give him another chance. So, I did. I decided to go visit him, despite everything that had happened. Maybe, just maybe, this time would be different. Maybe he'd listen to me, or at the very least, stop talking at me like I didn't exist. It didn't take long for things to go wrong. I tried to talk to him about an idea I had, a business idea I'd been thinking about for a while. I wanted to start something small, something that I could build from the ground up. It wasn't fully formed yet, but I was excited about it. I thought maybe if I shared it with Elijah, he'd be proud, or at least supportive. But instead, he just laughed, called it ridiculous, told me I was wasting my time and should focus on real work instead of fantasies. 
It was like every word that came out of his mouth was designed to tear me down. It wasn't just about the business idea. It was about everything. He criticized my interests, my thoughts, my dreams. Nothing was safe from his judgment. Then, of course, he had to make everything political. He started ranting about the government again, about how everything was a conspiracy, how people like me, young people with big ideas, were being brainwashed. It was exhausting. No matter what I said, he twisted it into something he could argue with, something he could dismiss as naive or stupid. I had never felt so small, so defeated. The worst part of that visit, though, wasn't the criticism. It was the casual racism that seemed to spill out of him at every opportunity. He'd always had his opinions, but this time, it was more than just offhand comments. He was ranting about immigrants, about how they were ruining the country, all while conveniently forgetting that he himself had moved to the U.S. from Canada. The hypocrisy was overwhelming, but I had always stayed quiet before, not wanting to start a fight. This time, I couldn't hold it in. I snapped. I argued back, pointed out the ridiculousness of his views, told him how wrong he was. And of course, that only made things worse. The entire weekend was ruined. He spent the rest of the time complaining about my bad attitude, about how I didn't respect him anymore. It was like talking to a brick wall. No matter what I said, he twisted it to make himself the victim and me the problem. It wasn't just his racist comments that pushed me over the edge, though. It was the way he talked about women. At one point during that miserable weekend, he launched into this rant about how 99% of women are greedy, about how men don't like successful women, and how a woman should always respect a man more than he respects her. He tried to soften the blow by saying I was an exception, but that only made me angrier. What kind of person says something like that? I couldn't believe I was related to him. By the end of the trip, I was done. I realized that Elijah wasn't the man I had loved as a kid. He wasn't the father who had once made me feel like I was his world. He was a bitter, angry man who had no interest in changing, no interest in being the father I needed him to be. It was like a switch had flipped in my head. I knew I couldn't keep hoping for something that wasn't going to happen. Elijah was who he was, and I had to accept that. But I didn't have to keep subjecting myself to his toxicity. When I got home, I told my mom everything. I expected her to brush it off like she had in the past, but this time was different. She was furious. She said she'd probably file for sole custody, that it was time to cut ties with Elijah for good. A part of me felt relieved, like a weight was finally being lifted off my shoulders. I didn't want to be tied to him anymore, not legally, not emotionally. It was time to move on. In the days that followed, I started to focus more on my own goals. I threw myself into my studies, spent more time writing, and try to figure out what I wanted my future to look like. I stopped caring about what Elijah thought, stopped worrying about his opinion. I had spent too long chasing his approval, hoping for a relationship that would never be the same again. Bill continued to be a source of support. He didn't push me, didn't try to force me to talk about Elijah if I didn't want to. He was just there, steady and reliable, like a real father should be. And for the first time in a long time, I felt like I could breathe. I wasn't sure what the future held, but I knew one thing for certain. I wasn't going to let Elijah's failures define me. I wasn't going to let his anger and bitterness drag me down anymore. I had my own path to follow, my own life to live, and I was finally ready to leave him behind. By the time I hit 16, I thought I had seen and felt all the ways Elijah could disappoint me. I thought I'd heard every ridiculous rant, every misguided opinion, every casual dismissal of the things that mattered to me. But somehow, he managed to surprise me again, each new blow worse than the last. It started with something that, looking back, I probably should have seen coming. Elijah had always had strong opinions about what a real man was. It was one of those things he liked to rant about during his conspiracy-fueled tirades, like he had some secret knowledge about how the world was supposed to work. So when he started making comments about some of my male friends from school, I shouldn't have been caught off guard, but it still hit me like a punch in the gut when he sneered about them, calling them weak and saying they weren't real men because some of them were gay. He acted like their sexuality made them lesser somehow, as if their kindness, their intelligence, and their friendship to me didn't matter anymore. It was like he was trying to chip away at the people who mattered to me, 
making me feel ashamed of them just because they didn't fit his narrow idea of what men should be. And that wasn't even the worst of it. At the time, I had been working on a plan to volunteer in the Dominican Republic. My mom's side of the family has roots there, and I felt like it would be a great opportunity to connect with my heritage and make a difference in a community that was part of my own history. I was so excited about it. I had been talking to my mom's relatives, working on applications, trying to figure out how to fund the trip. It was something I was proud of, something I knew would help me grow. But when I told Elijah about it, hoping for just a sliver of support, he crushed any hope I had. He made some offhand comment about how I shouldn't be wasting my time helping those people. He spat out those last two words like they were poison. He didn't care that they were part of my family, part of me. He reduced an entire culture to something he saw as beneath him, something not worth my time. It made me sick. Here was this man who was so full of himself, so full of hate, and he didn't even see how much damage he was causing. He didn't care. After that conversation, I started to feel the final threads of our relationship unraveling. I had tried so many times to reconnect with him, to find that version of Elijah I had known when I was younger, but it was clear that he was long gone. Or maybe he had never really been the person I thought he was. Maybe he had always been this bitter, angry man, and I had just been too young to see it. Despite all of this, for reasons I still can't quite explain, I decided to give him one more chance. I told myself it was the right thing to do, that maybe this time would be different. Maybe I could get through to him. Maybe he'd finally hear me. So I went to see him again, one last attempt at salvaging whatever was left of our relationship. I had my business plan with me, the one I had been working on for months. I had also been looking into some prestigious universities, places I knew would challenge me and help me build the future I wanted. I thought maybe if I showed him how serious I was, how much work I had put into everything, he'd stop dismissing me. He'd see that I wasn't just some naive kid with big dreams. I was capable. I was ready to take on the world. But, predictably, he shot me down. He laughed at my business plan again, called it ridiculous, and said I was too young to understand how the real world worked. He made fun of the schools I was looking at, mocking me for thinking I could get in. His words cut deeper than I expected. It wasn't just that he didn't believe in me. It was the way he seemed to relish in tearing me down. It was like he couldn't stand the idea of me succeeding without him, of me being happy and fulfilled in ways he clearly wasn't. The worst part, though, was when the conversation inevitably turned to immigrants again. It was always the same with Elijah. This obsessive need to blame others for the world's problems, to reduce complex issues to simple scapegoats. It hurt even more this time because both my mother and his wife, Rebecca, were Latina. How could he be married to someone from that background and still spew this hateful rhetoric? How could he look at his own wife, at me, and not see the damage his words were causing? I left that visit feeling completely drained. Any hope I had of repairing our relationship was gone. I knew, deep down, that it was over. I couldn't keep pretending that Elijah would change. He wouldn't. He was stuck in his ways, too far gone to see what he was losing. And I was done trying to save him. The final nail in the coffin came not long after, during another one of his sexist rants. We were at his house, and he started talking about women's workout clothes, specifically leggings. He said women only wore them to attract men's attention, that it was all about showing off. I tried to hold my tongue, tried to avoid the argument that I knew was coming, but I couldn't. I called him out, told him how disgusting it was to reduce women to what they wore to think that everything they did was for male approval. But Elijah didn't back down. He just doubled down on his views, insisting that most women were like that. And then, as if to make things better, he told me I was different. I was the exception. As if that was supposed to make me feel good. It didn't. It just made me angrier. His words shattered whatever was left of the respect I had for him. I realized in that moment that I couldn't look up to him anymore. I couldn't even pretend to see him as my father. But the disappointments didn't stop with Elijah. For a long time, Bill had been my rock, the one person I felt I could trust. Even though he hadn't wanted to adopt me, I had convinced myself that it was just because he was trying to be respectful of Elijah. I told myself that Bill still loved me, that he still saw me as his own. But then I overheard something that destroyed that belief. Bill was talking to my mom one night, 
and I heard him say something that made my stomach drop. He said that foster children can't be loved in the same way as your own children. I couldn't believe it. I had always thought Bill saw me as his daughter, that he loved me like he loved his biological kids. But hearing those words, it shattered something inside me. It felt like the ground had been pulled out from under me, and I was falling, with nothing to hold on to. I started to question everything. Had Bill ever really cared about me? Or had I just been fooling myself, hoping for something that wasn't real? The trust one had in him began to erode, and I found myself pulling away, retreating into myself. I didn't know who to believe anymore. The two men who were supposed to be father figures in my life had both let me down in ways I couldn't have imagined. As if that wasn't enough, I learned something even more devastating from my cousins. Bill had cheated on my mom years ago. I didn't know how to process it at first. My mom had never told me, never even hinted that something like that had happened. I had always thought that my parents' relationship was solid, that Bill was the one person I could count on to be faithful and supportive. But now I realized that wasn't true. Bill had betrayed my mom just like Elijah had betrayed mine. The very thing that had destroyed my family in the first place, infidelity, had been lurking in the shadows of my new family all along. It was like a cruel twist of fate, a sick reminder that no matter how hard I tried to escape the cycle of betrayal and disappointment, it kept finding its way back into my life. I didn't know what to do with the anger and hurt that were building up inside me. I felt betrayed by both Elijah and Bill, and I didn't know who to trust anymore. I couldn't talk to my mom about it. She was already dealing with enough. And after she had refused to let me go to therapy, I didn't feel like I could rely on her for emotional support. So I did the only thing I could think of. I buried myself in my work. I threw myself into my schoolwork, into my plans for the future. I started applying for scholarships, looking at universities that would take me as far away from this mess as possible. I knew I had to get out, to escape the toxic environment that had become my life. I didn't want to rely on anyone anymore. I didn't want to get hurt again. The isolation was hard at first. I felt like I was living in a fog, going through the motions of everyday life while inside. I was crumbling. But the more I focused on my studies, the clearer my path became. I had a plan now. I was going to finish school, get into a good university, and leave this place behind. I wasn't going to let Elijah or Bill dictate my future anymore. I was going to build my own life, on my own terms. It wasn't easy. There were days when the weight of everything felt unbearable, when I wanted to scream or cry or just disappear for a while. But I kept pushing forward. I kept reminding myself that I was stronger than the people who had let me down. I had survived their betrayals, their neglect, their lies. And now, I was going to survive on my own. My mom was supportive in her own way, though she didn't always understand what I was going through. She was angry about Elijah, about the way he had treated me, and she was still talking about filing for sole custody. But I was past the point of caring about the legalities of it all. I just wanted to be free. I wanted to escape. As graduation loomed closer, I could feel the tension building inside me. I knew that once I walked across that stage, diploma in hand, everything would change. I would be free to start over, to build a life that wasn't defined by the failures of the people around me. I wasn't going to let Elijah's homophobia, sexism, and racism define me. I wasn't going to let Bill's betrayal break me. I wasn't going to let my mom's refusal to let me get the help I needed hold me back. I was going to leave all of it behind. The anger, the disappointment, the hurt. I was going to pack it away and start fresh. This was my escape plan and I was determined to see it through.